Hello and welcome to Meters 101 webinar. Uh, it's presented by the Pentair Training Institute. I'm Dan Featherstone uh, and we'll be talking today, uh, like I say, primarily on how to use that multimeter or that meter you might have in your truck. Now before we get going, this is a little housekeeping I like to do and let you know about other opportunities. Uh, if you go to our website, stayright, sta-rite.com or berkeleypumps.com under the resource tab uh, on the website, you will see on the left hand side there's learning opportunities uh, where you can uh, go ahead and uh, pull up our uh, different opportunities, one of which is the Pentair Learning Center, uh, the PLC we also call it. It has interactive uh, learning e-modules. It has live webinars from both Bill and myself. Uh, so you can look these up at your own time and, and watch them at your own time and, and speed. Um, or you can also like us and, and follow us on Facebook uh, under the Pentair Training Institute there. Uh, that gives you uh, updates on when we'll be out in the field and such uh, locally and about uh, webinars and such. So you can follow us that way too. Uh, we do have the Pentair Pro Dealer Program. If you're an installer or dealer, uh, go to www.pentairprodealer.com. Um, it's a rewards program. A lot of companies have the rewards program. Uh, a lot of them are very good. Ours is a great one. It helps you build the business, gives you reward points, or, and, and uh, even uh, labor and extended warranty programs are there. Uh, so look into that. The customer access portal uh, to sign up, give us a call at 866-880-3771. Uh, gives you 24-7 access to product availability, pricing, order status, etc. Um, it's a great way to keep in touch, and, and especially, you know, nowadays, it's, it's all over that good old internet. So it's a great tool, or uh, being the hunter, I like to say it's another arrow to have in your quiver there. You know what I'm saying? Don't forget, we also have our Pentair factory schools uh, to register. You can go right to our website, like I said. Uh, we do the water systems and the ag industrial, which is more uh, in-depth uh, and, and, and more uh, intense training. Uh, these are three-day schools. They're offered in Delavan and in Grand Island now. Uh, we will also have factory training schools. Or uh, if you're interested and you have enough persons, uh, talk with your local salesperson uh, or contact us, at, and we can uh, work with you and set up special trainings. Uh, we're always willing to go out in the field and, and meet, meet and greet you and, and go right to your facilities. Okay, now like I said, uh, let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, this module is, is about meters. And uh, at least for the last few years, this is the hot topic. Everyone was talking about meters, and especially a meg-ohm meter or a megger, um, and, and their usage. So we're going to talk about what the meters, the usage, and even give you a little bit of advice about what maybe to select. Uh, different types of meters we'll cover is the ohm meter, the meg-ohm meter, an amp meter, uh, versus the probe, uh, an AC meter, a DC meter, capacitance meters, multimeters, and also voltage detection device or use of a meter when measuring ground. This one here, uh, I'm sure many of us that have been in the industry uh, have lived and died by the good old Simpson 372. It's a great meter. It measures basic ground, um, and it, it's very reliable. It measures up to 20 million ohms. Uh, now, where it's disadvantaged lies is especially with a newer technology coming out, it doesn't measure insulation as well as a meg ohm meter. Understand that like the Simpson, for example, or a multimeter, and, and I showed the Simpson, don't get me wrong, the Simpson's an analog meter. It's a very good meter, very precise meter. Um, if you're in the computer industry, um, or for example, my son, uh, he's going off to college, to be a marine biologist and they will use these types of uh, Simpson meters to measure uh, their test equipment and such for various things. Um, so they're very precise, they're very good. Digital meters are also very good. They can read up to 20 million ohms. But typically a standard multimeter or the Simpson meter, it doesn't put out a lot of DC voltage. Uh, typically the Simpson meter runs on a 1.5 C cell or a 30 volt square battery. Um, your digital meter might put out 9 volts, uh, so you're not really testing the installation as well. Um, 
But not to say I want to want you all to get rid of your Simpson 372. Um, they still do very good uh, measurements when you're looking at measuring the uh, resistance on the winding and such. But in our industry, I can kind of tell you honestly, they're fading and fading fast. Meg ohm meter. Um, now, you probably have also heard of them as referred to as a megger. Uh, just real briefly, the story on that, a megger is actually a company. Um, as Kleenex is the tissue, megger the company, because they are been out there and, and been building these and kind of thought as the industry standard, especially by power companies, has been synonymous with meg ohm meter. Um, now, what a meg ohm meter really is, it's a ohm meter with a lot of output, meaning that in our industry, uh, plumbers out there, when they plumb a home, they often then put a Schrader valve in there and pressure test the lines. They boost the pressure up well above what it would normally have to hold. Um, now, I'm sure if there's a plumber out there who's going to laugh at, at the numbers I say, but they might say pump it up to say 100 PSI and see if it can hold, the system holds the integrity of the air pressure for say 20 minutes or so. What they're trying to do is find out where they might have leakage. And, pre and to prevent water damage, so they'll pressure test the system and then go back and soap bubble test if it's leaking, find out where the leaks are and repair them. That's what a meg ohm meter does for electricians. What a meg ohm meter does, it puts out voltage anywhere from 50 volts to 1,000 volts DC. And typically, they test the wires and the motor and its ability to keep electricity from getting to ground and hurting someone or causing stray capacitance. And the general rule of thumb is if you set your your meter, that like I say, is from 50 to 1,000 volts DC, you take your voltage, say you're at 230, and you double it or take it by two and a half times that rate, and that's what you set your meter for. So I myself often go right to 1,000 or to 500 at the minimum um, to pressure test. And when you hook up your meter, and, and in this discussion, I'll tell you, if you don't have alligator clips for your, for your meg-ohm meter, get some. You don't want to try to be holding the wire. Uh, so you connect your, your meter properly. You connect your probe set. You hit your meg-ohm meter, and typically I say 500 or 1,000, and it's going to tell you in, in ohms how much resistance there is uh, for the current to leave the installation. The bigger the number, the better. That's the key. I want to see big numbers. I want to see 5 million, you know, 10 million, 2 giga ohm. Um, so you want to see big, big numbers. The smaller the number, the more chance electricity is going to go where it shouldn't be. Now, uh, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I was nervous talking about mega ohm meters about five years ago. First reason is because mega ohm meters are expensive. A good fluke meter, for example, will cost you seven hundred to a thousand dollars. And as happened to me, one of my meters walked out the door. So I had to go back to my boss and explain why a seven hundred dollar meter left the building. Um, doing some research, I found out there's plenty of choices out there. There's, there's Good meg ohm meters out there, some of them as little as $150. And I've, in my collection, I have about seven different meg ohm meters and multimeters. And uh, I can tell you, comparatively to the Fluke, uh, for example, and I mentioned Fluke because we all know Fluke as kind of an industry standard. Um, Megger is another industry standard, but those are very expensive meters that I can't afford. Um, but I can tell you, most of the meters I check out are, are pretty accurate. Um, so a meg ohm meter tests the integrity of the wire insulation or the motor insulation or both. And it's a very good meter to have, especially if you're using a variable frequency drive. An amp meter or a probe. Uh, first and foremost, if you're using a multimeter and it has that little setting for up to 10 amps, uh, so you can measure amperage with it, first understand those are really designed for DC motors. When you turn on an electric motor like a pump, an AC motor, it has kilovolt amperage surge, which can be up to nine times the normal amp load. You hook up your meter that's a little digital uh, or, or even an analog, a little 10 amp meter, 
you turn on that pump and that meter is going to go poof. So don't do it. The other side of the coin is, is this. In order for those little multimeters to measure, you have to cut the line or the circuit and put it in line. So you connect, You say you have your, your yellow wire on your pump, you cut it and, and, and clean off the ends there so you can alligator clip the red to one side, the black of the probe to the other side, and now it's in line in circuit. Uh, and that's very impractical. Why would we be cutting line unless we absolutely have to? So we use what's referred to as an amp meter uh, that has, as you see here in the picture, these little clamps, these little circular uh, portions that go around the wire. And, it, and if you uh, have listened to my electrical 101, one of the things I point out is that AC current puts out a magnetic field, a disrupts a magnetic field. That's what these are measuring. That's why they're not affected by the kilovolt amperage uh, or the inrush current when the motor starts because that, that magnetic field warps for uh, just a second so there's no physical contact to the meter and it doesn't, doesn't harm it. Uh, and it measures the magnetic field. Now another tip if you have slack in the wire, an uh, electrician told me this, is that he, he loops the wire three times and then clamps it and then test runs the motor. The reason he does that is he then looks at the number which will be three times higher in this example because he looped it three times. But however number of loops you loop it, you divide the number by. And that gives you the average reading, which gives you a little bit more precise reading possibly. That is a nice helpful tip I actually got from a student uh, who was listening to the webinar. And uh, I was very grateful for that. But what we're doing is we're measuring the disruption in the magnetic field. Now, a lot of guys say, too, is, is why even showing it in an analog with the needle swing versus the digital? The digital is so much more accurate. Well, a few things. One, if you're working with a lot of three-phase motors, I like clamp-on meters that are voltmeters and amp meters because the needle will fluctuate and it doesn't have memory. So, example, if a three-phase power, I have a wild leg I'm trying to track down, I can do it easier with an analog meter. Uh, I've been in inst instances where we've taken three analog meters, put them on each power leg coming in, so we can monitor the voltage on each leg independently. Why not use a digital? Because too often digitals will sample for a period of time, and then they lock in a number. Or they average the number for you and don't keep reporting. So analog ones are very visual, and they don't have that memory issue. Um, and I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm just saying it can be annoying if I'm trying to track down my wild leg. Uh, so analogs are still out there. Uh, you know, I had one gentleman say, well, where are you ever going to find one? Good old Amazon.com. Uh, not advertising for Amazon, but uh, I can tell you I'm always amazed. Good old Amazon.com. Google it. I'm sure there's plenty of other companies, eBay, all of these places where you can find analog meters that are good quality and more importantly uh, are often more practical especially if you're running three-phase power uh, systems okay but remember an amp meter if it doesn't clamp on I wouldn't use it you want one that clamps on because if you use that little multimeter one we're going to smoke it AC meter uh, very typically you only see these on equipment uh, but uh, when you're looking at an AC voltage meter, it would be volts, and then often it will have a little squiggle or that sine wave symbol showing AC or alternating current. It might not even have volts. It might just show the, the uh, sine wave symbol to designate it. Uh, it measures capacity of the flow of the voltage. Uh, and sometimes, uh, like in our home, our AC meters uh, will measure also power consumption. Uh, Typically, if you're going to see these now, uh, you're going to see it in a multimeter where it has AC, DC, ohms, and many more uh, measurements that the meters can make. DC meter, same principle, uh, although here's a nice picture. DC is often indicated by a straight bar or a straight bar with a, dot, a dashed line below it uh, indicating a DC current, which DC is direct flow. Um, again, typically you're only going to see these on pieces of machinery. It's very rare that you're going to find a dedicated AC handheld meter or a dedicated DC meter. 
um, unless you're maybe in some sort of manufacturing situation where that's all you need to measure. Capacitance meters, uh, these measure the microfarads that come out of the uh, capacitor. I recommend getting a meter that has the capability of reading uh, typically up to 200 microfarads minimum uh, so you can read what the actual put out or, or production is of the capacitor. Um, the older test with the Simpson meter watching the needle go back and forth, um, not to knock it, but that just tells me that the capacitor is looking for current and grabbing it. It doesn't tell me what the output is. Uh, the key also to remember is with the black or brown, dark brown start capacitors, um, those have a range of say 86 microfarad plus 20 minus zero. You can't go below the minimum microfarad which is 86 uh, in our example. Uh, so always check your, your, your capacitor. Um, so you can't go below but you can always go above 20%. Run capacitors, the silver ones, are often, say, 35 microfarad plus or minus 5%. So read to know what number you're looking for. You might have to do a little math. Now, a lot of guys tell me they don't bother looking at capacitors because, Dan, you can tell when they're bad. You can tell this. Not always. Uh, if a pump is buzzing or humming, especially when the motor starts to get warm and it's cycling, that's where capacitors that are a bit weak can be the key issue. And here's a tip. If you notice that the capacitors are blowing out or are getting weakened and you're often replacing capacitors, capacitors are rated microfarad, but they're also rated for voltage. So, for example, you might have one that's rated, uh, uh, say, 86 microfarad plus 20 minus zero at 370 volts. And we keep having to replace that capacitor every two years or so, uh, or, or the control box. A trick you can do, often if the capacitor, and that's why you want to check it, if the capacitors are getting beat up, you can buy ones with better insulation. Meaning that if it's rated for 370 volt, buy one that's rated for 460 volt. The higher the voltage that they're rated for to, to uh, handle, the more insulation that's there. By getting one that's rated 86 microfarads or very close to that, uh, you know, you, can, you say if you find one that's rated for 92 microfarads, you can always go up a little bit. Don't go down. But you get one that's rated for a higher voltage capacity. Uh, you have better insulation, and you usually get longer runtime out of that capacitor. So that's why when you're saying capacitors, who cares? Stop a minute and care, okay? And, and understand, this capacitor meter test takes but 20 seconds, okay? So don't just gloss over capacitors. Take a look at them. A voltage meter or a voltage detector. Um, you know, in the past life, uh, my, my father passed away around 99, and I had to come back home to the farm. And I was at a crossroads in my life where I was wondering what I was going to do. And my brother was a mason by trade, and um, I was a uh, going to be an electrician because he was always afraid of electrical. And I thought, well, I'll do the electrical work for him. First and foremost, I want to make this clear, don't touch electrical. Um, with your bare hands. Don't don't go up there and tap, see if the motor is, is, is shocking people. <laughs> you know, don't do it. If you're foolish enough to do it, do it with the back of your hand. Because remember, like if you touch an electric fence with the palm of your hand, your, your fingers are going to contract and you're going to latch onto that wire. So do it from the back of your hand. So when I was training to be an electrician, we were taught one hand in pocket, no shocky. Uh, which literally meant you put one hand in your pocket, or we were taught as electricians to go reach behind your belt to your utility belt and grab that, and then with the back of your hand, touch the electrical device to see if it's on. Reason for that, if you're foolish enough to grab it with the palm of your hand and you latch onto the equipment, if your hand is free, the other hand, and your other hand is locked on a piece of equipment, your natural instinct is to try to grab that hand and free it. And by doing that, you create a circuit across your heart, and you could very well die. So that's where we're at. Very first and foremost, don't be touching electrical wires. If you must, then do it with the back of your hand, but don't touch electrical wires. Break out a voltage detection device. When I push the little button that you see on this unit, if I put it anywhere where near voltage is present, it would sound. Now, I know electric electricians, they don't like to rely upon these. Um, 
that is my first step. Um, if I'm still in doubt, or more importantly, if I do detect voltage, especially on ground, I would then pull out my voltmeter, set it for volts AC, and from ground to any metal, say the junction box, the, the conduit, uh, maybe the screws, uh, unpainted screws on, on my main box, I would look to see if I have more than a half a volt. If I do, then i got to figure out what's wrong with my uh, ground. Now, that being said, I don't want you to become electricians. I don't want you to violate your license. Understand your license and the categories. Um, we went over this in the electrical uh, 101 section of the webinars. But briefly, uh, most well drillers and well installers are only CAT2, which means electrical-wise, we can go to the pressure switch, maybe to the disconnect switch, and that's it. We do not go into the main distribution panel or the homeowner's uh, circuit box, for example. Uh, that's where the electricians go. Secondly, don't be afraid to ask for help. If you measure voltage on the ground and you can't figure out where it's coming from, there is no shame. There is nobody that would, I would hope, there is nobody that would call you out because you called an electrician for help. Okay? Don't violate your, your license code. And, and don't be afraid to ask for help. So voltage detection pens, they're about $7 to $10. They're a good first line of defense. Uh, when in doubt and you want to make sure, break out your voltmeter. The good old multimeters, there's plenty of them out there. From Fluke, which is one of the top ends, you know, down to your, to your Harbor Freight and your cheaper ones. Um, in our industry, we need to buy a decent one. So when you're talking multimeters, you want a one that can measure volts AC up to 600 volts, uh, ideally, and are typically rated for CAT3. Even though we don't do CAT3 work, uh, ideally I would like to see my meter rated for up to CAT3. That tells me it's better insulated. Um, you also want it to read ohms. Ideally, if it can read up to 20 million ohms, that's great. I would like to see a capacitance uh, tester in there. Uh, and I also would like to see a meter that, if it can, has a meg ohm meter function to it. If I can't find one, I would buy a separate meg ohm meter. We talked about the different meters. If we buy a multimeter, this is what we're facing, all these little symbols. So what do they mean? Well, that top one, the V with a sine wave or a little, like, little S curve there, that's AC voltage. Sometimes you'll just see the sine wave with no V, v before it. The next one, as we saw on the earlier side, a solid bar or the bar with a dash below it, that's volts DC, uh, indicating direct current. MV, millivolts, if you're working with a uh, variable frequency drive, you might deal a little bit with mill millivolts, but typically you shouldn't have to. The capital A is for amps. Now remember, if it's a multimeter, and it has just the probes, not the loop, the, the clamping loop. That's probably only rated for up to 10 amps DC. If you use it in our industry with the pumps, with AC motors, and you're buying a new meter if you don't do it right, and you could get hurt, so be careful. MA is milliamps. The omega sign there, or the horseshoe, is ohms. Not to be confused with meg ohm meter. This one, the ohms, typically remember it's your Simpson or your, your standard digital meter that only maybe puts out a maximum of 30 volts versus a meg ohm meter that can be set up to 1,000 volts DC. Diode, we really don't use that much in our industry. Um, if you do some advanced testing on a variable frequency drive, you might use that. Uh, audible continuity, that little uh, sound wave, like the little sonar symbol there. Um, that is a simple pass-fail test, meaning if I have a stretch of wire and I strip both ends of it and I hook up one side of my probe set to the left, one side to the right, it will tone telling me that voltage can pass through there. It does not necessarily tell me resistance or, or if the wires are insulated properly. It just says voltage is going through that wire. The last one is capacitance. Uh, that's used to measure capacitors. Remember if you're going to get one, make sure it can read up to 200 uh, microfarads to make sure we're measuring ours properly. A lot of people ask me this, what meter is best, Dan? And, and one, analog meters, don't discount them. They have needles that react per, 
per reading. I mean, it, as you're hooking them up, if I have a wild leg that's varying voltage, I can see it very easy on an analog meter. Um, digital meters, uh, they're nice, but you also have to know if they're auto ranging. You have to watch where they're trying to set themselves. Also, you have to decipher what the K, the M, or nothing means. Um, for example, 21.5K would indicate 21,500. Now, also understand OL or L, or a one point way to the left. You want to read the factory manual, RTFM, to understand what that's telling you. And what that's telling you is it's out of limit. So say, for example, I have a meter that I can check uh, uh, ohms with and I can set the scale and I set it to 200 ohms. If my motor is so badly damaged, it's reading 207 ohms, it wouldn't show 207 because the upper limit is 200. It would say OL or L or L period or one period all the way to the left, for example, telling you it's not overloaded, it's out of the limit that you're trying to read. So then in that case, I would disconnect my wires, turn my meter, say, from 200 to, say, 2,000 ohms, reconnect the wires, get my reading, and now I would see that 207 or 492, whatever it was over the 200, it could not read. So you have to kind of understand how these meters work. Here's the real answer. What are you comfortable with? What did you grow up with? Not telling you my exact age, but I can tell you when I was in high school, digital meters were very expensive and, and not readily readily available. I used a lot of analog meters. I'm used to them. Do I not use digital? Sure, I use digital nowadays, but I've taught myself to use them. Um, so whatever you're comfortable with, and more importantly, what work are you doing? All right. If you're working with variable frequency drive, or you're, you're in the business of, of doing a lot of trenching wiring, for example, you better get a mega ohm meter. If I'm working with a lot of three-phase, especially in my territory, if I'm working there and I have three-phase, and most of the three-phase is done by a wide delta or an open delta three-phase uh, supply, which means I have that wild leg, I'd want some analog meters because then I could watch in real time how the voltage is swaying or amps are being uh, diverted or changing. Uh, so it, it really depends on quite a few factors. But the key is, what are you doing and what are you comfortable using to get the job done right? Okay, so we ask ourselves, what do we need to measure? Do we need to measure uh, insulation? Get a mega. Okay. Do you work with variable frequency drives? Then you might have to read milliamps and millivolts. Okay. Do you use electric motor testing repair? You know, there, a good old multimeter and especially a good ohm meter to check the windings. Do you have a working knowledge and comfort with measuring live current? Understand a lot of our guys in our industry don't like live current, and I get that, and I respect that. But if you are comfortable with working with live current, uh, or if you do find yourself in a situation, remember, you want a meter that can read at least up to 600 volts and is CAT3. But when you're measuring voltage, always have alligator clips or some sort of clip that can slide on your probes so you can set your wires up. See, turn off the power to the, to the device, your motor, your pump control, whatever. Have the power off. Connect the alligator clips to read the voltage. Set your meter to the highest reading, 600 volts, and set it down. So now you're not touching anything, then turn on your power and look at your meter. reason I mention that is if for some reason the power is not properly regulated and it goes over 600 volts, it, the, that meter might not be able to hold the insulation properly and you could get shocked. So don't be holding it, okay? especially if you're not sure about the power supply. So always take cautions when you're measuring voltage. Okay. Do you run a lot of wire? Are you a trench? Do you trench a lot of uh, uh, runs and such? Then again, a meg ohm meter might be great. Now, the last one I always joke: Does your work site have wires that cannot be accounted for? Of course they do. I can tell you in my experience, I can't count the times I've walked into a, and I've looked in a well, and there's the well, and there's seven wires sticking out of it. There's the old red, yellow, and black wires that are so old, they're probably, you know, probably saw the First World War. 
I say that jokingly, of course, but I mean, you've seen that where they've just left some wires, they just clip them, say at the end of the conduit, and just leave them hanging there. So every job site might have wires that aren't fully accounted for. Remember, break out that voltage pen uh, that detects the voltage or break out your meter and make sure the wires are in fact dead because remember, don't assume, okay? The key is, is to remember who you really work for. I ask this question. I say, you know, who do you work for? And people say, well, I work for this company. Someone asked me, you know, I might have in the day said, well, I work for Pentair. But here's the truth. Pentair is kind and generous enough to give me a job I enjoy, and more importantly, they compensate me for it. They pay me for it. But I'm not working for Pentair 1,000%. I know there's no such thing as 1,000%. Uh, but I'm not working for Pentair 100%. I'm working for my family. I work for my family first and foremost. And then, of course, I work for the company. So remember that. Remember there's people that expect you home each night. Friends, family, sons, daughters. So be careful out there, okay? Last question is, what's your budget? Uh, I just told you the story there where I had a fluke meter walk out the door, and I had the unenviable position of going to my superior, my boss, who a good friend of mine, we get along fine, but I still had to tell him, um, hey, boss, a $1,000 meter walked out the door, and I cannot figure out where it went. Wasn't happy. Now, so understand... Fluke makes great meters, Mega makes great meters, Ideal, all of them make good meters. Most of them read within a biscuit of each other, very close. So often you can buy meters that are at a better dollar. But understand this, respect it. Don't drop it, don't bang it around, especially you know, like fluke meters are well protected. But the cheaper meters often are not as well. So if you drop one, say, off of the tabletop or off, it falls off the back of your truck onto the asphalt, your meter could start reading different numbers or might even be damaged. So take care of it, protect it. The other thing is don't leave it where it's obviously going to get stolen. A lot of people say, oh, criminals are all stupid. No, they're not. Trust me. If they see a Fluke 1570 sitting on your dash and you leave the truck window open while you're getting lunch, don't be surprised when it walks out the door because most criminals know those things are worth easily three to 400 bucks at a pawn shop. Okay, So protect your investment. Uh, make sure you understand uh, that what it can do and its limitations. And, and also, you know, don't be afraid to do a little research you know, and ask. When you go like, to the National Groundwater Association or you go to one of my trainings, ask other guys what they're using. Okay? There's plenty of meters out there that do a great job. Voltage testing, don't let the homeowner do it. I just don't recommend it at all. I also respect fully, as a well driller or a pump installer, you're nervous around it. Okay, But here's a few tips. One is get some alligator clips so you don't have to hold it. Two, always measure L1 to L2. Don't measure each leg to ground. Measure L1 to L2. So your input, uh, for example, uh, your centrifugal motor, you have L1, L2. You want to measure across there, 230 or 115, um, depending upon what the incoming power is. For your for your uh, two-wire motors, you would want to measure the motor, lead, the motor output on the pressure switch going down to the motor. And then you measure the two uh, outer screws, for example, for the incoming power to see if there's a difference. When measuring voltage, always take precautions, wear your PPE, your personal protective equipment, and also understand what your license permit. Most of our licenses are only CAT2, which means we do not go into the main power uh, distribution box, period. Voltage readings can also vary. Don't be surprised. On the left there, I have two fluke meters. One's the uh, 87.3, which is reading 211. The other one's the clamp-on, which is reading 212. Am I really concerned for my pump that it's reading differently? My pump does not know the difference between one volt. Okay, So there I'm not overly concerned. The analog meter on the right, you'd have to interpret where that needle falls. So that's where a lot of people kind of don't like an analog meter because it doesn't give you a rock-solid number. What it would show is if that voltage is varying, that needle would move with the variance. And that's where I myself, especially with three-phase, like to see an analog meter. 
Remember also AC voltage can vary plus or minus 10%. That means 115 can vary from 103.5 to 126.5. Uh, or voltage on 230 can vary from uh, 207 to 253. Now, can you use a standard meter for a VFT? And I get this question not so much anymore because an RMS or a root mean square type of meter or a low-pass filter meter are now much more common. But probably about five, six years ago, we get this call probably about once a week. Oh, my goodness, I'm reading 322 volts on my VFT output. I'm going to burn up my motor. And most meters that are not root mean square or RMS function or have a low pass filter where you push a little button, they don't do math. That's the simple thing it's telling you. That these meters often read peak to peak. And not getting into too much detail, we do have a webinar on VFDs, but uh, VFDs can spike up to 320 volts, sometimes a little higher. You want to divide that number by the square root of 2 the root mean square. So you would take 322 divided by 1.414 and it equals 227.72 rounding to 228. Now how can you recommend or how can you remember 1.414? I told you that's the square root of 2. Now I'm full of little stupid sayings. You know how I remember it? I remember it because it, it's the area code for the greatest city in, in America where Harley Davidson was made. Uh, where Pabst Blue Ribbon and many of the beer, beer companies uh, started, good old Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You ever want to call Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Well, you dial 1414 in the number. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, Dan, I don't live in Wisconsin. How am I ever going to remember that? Because you're going to think about that idiot Dan telling you the stupid story and Google Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I don't know. But I always like to throw it out there. I'm also, if, as you can tell, very proud of my state. Okay, a good place to measure voltage is the pressure switch in a traditional system, okay? So you'd measure your two outer screws, which are often your incoming power supply, and your two inner screws, which is your outgoing power supply. Now, I'm going to ask you here, I'm going to pause for a second, what's wrong with these pictures? Even our seasoned pro there, uh, my senior trainer at the time, Bill, he's using both hands. He's not using alligator clips or little J-hook clips. He's using both hands. And in doing that, if for some reason those probe sets were damaged, and if you notice in one picture his four fingers were touching, he could hurt himself. So always be precautious. If you're going to use two hands, then wear insulated gloves. And don't tell me they're hard to find. Good old Ace Hardware True Value, the mom and pop shops, they have them. Measure voltage on a VFD. Remember, if you have the low pass function, you push that button, or if it is an RMS capable, it will do it for you automatically always, okay? Measuring amps, remember this is a live test, but if you look at these pictures, the clamp goes around an insulated wire. We're not disconnecting anything. If you're afraid of voltage, you don't want to measure voltage, then go to amperage. Because amperage can tell you a whole lot of what's going on too. And also notice you have to measure each wire separately. So in the case of a three wire, you'd measure the yellow, the red, and the black separately. Okay. So now the other piece of advice, and I think I mentioned it earlier, if you have enough slack, one electrician tells me that he'll loop it three times and put the three loops through the magnetic field, that little clamp, and get a higher reading on the amp load. Then he divides it by three to get the average. He does that because he feels, and I've had other electricians tell me too, it gives him a more accurate reading. So whatever your preference and what you can and can't do. Uh, in this case, if you notice the wires kind of twisted, there's no way we could, we could loop it three times. So sometimes you just have to do it with just the one wire. Ideally, also try to center the wire because by having it off to one side, it changes the magnetic field. So it might read maybe a tenth of an of a, uh, amp difference. I know I said earlier, uh, with the voltmeter, I didn't care if it was maybe rounding a little differently. So it's 211 versus 212. When you're talking amp load, tenths of an amp can count sometimes. So there you might want to make sure you're getting a more accurate reading by trying to center that wire a bit. Okay? Last, do not mistake again that multimeter as an amp meter. Okay. Now, when you're looking, most companies, 
for example, uh, we have our PN 793 electronics manual, we call it. Franklin has the good old AIM. But whoever the motor manufacturer is, when you get your numbers, you can look up what they mean. So, for example, if I know I have a half horsepower 230 volt motor, I know I should be measuring 5.3 on the yellow wire, 5.3 on the black, and red should read zero. Why zero? Even though the pump is active and pulling water? Because if you look at the left, this is for cap start induction run motor. That means if I pull the cover off the casing, I will only find a start capacitor, not a run capacitor. So that's where you also have to know what you're looking at when you look up the numbers, okay? Each motor manufacturer might have different numbers or different ways to interpret the number as far as how they chart it, like, like you see on the screen. Um, when in doubt, call the factory. Customer service, I can tell you here at Pentair, you're, you're our lifeblood. We want to make sure you're doing it right. And if you have questions, that's what we're here for. Please call us. Ohms. Ohms is, is measuring the resistance through the entire winding in the case of a two-wire or the start or the main on a three-wire. And these tests here, if you're afraid of electricity, these are what I kind of call as our cat one test, meaning that we're measuring the motor. There's no voltage present. Uh, and, and and the only power supply to the motor is what the meter is giving. Yes, these meters actually put out a little current to measure what the resistance is. They have to. But it's nothing that can hurt you uh, unless you're using a mega meter. Then you could be putting out a 1,000 volts DC, which means you got to pay attention. Um, so again, wear your PPE, your personal protective equipment. Uh, so these tests are going to give you a solid number, which you then take back to the book, and you can compare on this page you'll see for example again talking about a half horsepower motor the start winding should be 10.4 to 11.7 for 230 volt or 2.6 to 3.3 so again refer to the manual read that factory manual RTFM okay there's a lot of good information in the owners manuals of these units and, and I t you know I tease guys when I started, you know, young age working on the factory farm, the manual was something that I sat on to keep my butt dry when I was working in the field. When I came to customer service, I couldn't believe that they would pay me to read a manual. And I started doing it, and I realized, wow, there's a lot of good information in that manual. So don't be afraid to pick up that manual and read it. Mega ohms, okay, these are specifically designed to check the insulation of the wire and the motor. You're going to put down voltage two to two and a half times. So that means if I'm reading 230 volt, 230 volt times two is 460. I would set that meter up to a minimum of 500 volts, maybe even go right to a thousand. And what we're trying to do is we're over pressurizing the wire and the motor windings, and it won't hurt it. Uh, uh, in fact, often, uh, especially for motors, it's not uncommon to leave that test go for 10, uh, one minute or 10 minutes. Um, especially for maintenance measurements. So you're overcharging the unit specifically to see if voltage can leak. We're pressure testing the insulation. Okay? You want big numbers. You want big numbers, 20 million, 5 million, 2 million. When you start to get down to, say, 200,000 or less, depending upon the motor, for example, Beldor, Beldor doesn't like to see their insulation on a three-phase motor to be less than 5 million ohms. That causes concern for them. Submersible pumps, if it gets below 200,000, not, not 5 million, 200,000 ohms, then we're concerned. So always refer to the factory manual. Here is uh, that fluke I was talking about earlier. Um, depending upon the meter, often like in the case here of the fluke, the 1570, all buttons and markings in orange indicate the insulation test. Okay. Now this one it shows nicely the alligator clips. The other one, now Fluke for example has a set that we, the probe when you when you're ready to test it, you hold the meter in one hand and you push the button on the probe to do the test. That's okay. Uh, you know, I myself would still put the alligator clip on and then push the button on the uh, on the actual meter itself. Now, because this is an ohms test, I'm not afraid to hold the meter. If it's an AC test, or you're testing voltage, then I would want that meter 
to be on the ground or maybe setting on you know uh, the motor somewhere where I could read it without having to hold it. Uh, this here uh, is my substitute. Like I said, I've lost my fluke. This one here is a Mastec that I got from good old uh, Amazon.com, and you'll see it it is not color coded as well. So you have to read the factory manual or understand how the meters work. And so here I have it set up to read, uh, it says installation test of 50 to 100, uh, 1,000 volts. And then I have to set up, now I pulled the, the picture to the left there, I pulled the probes out so you could better see uh, where it says tens, test installation. They're both red. Uh, and, and that's where I would set it up to measure. Now when you're doing a mega ohm test, now if you look at the picture to the right, are you surprised that I'm reading two giga ohms on a very short piece of wire that is very brand new, <laughs> well insulated? So when I push the test, it's testing, it's putting out 1,028 volts, and it's measuring that greater sign, it's measuring over two giga ohms. So that wire is perfectly fine, okay? Insulation resistance, you know, like I say, uh, when you're doing ground, now this is out of our uh, PN793, the uh, electronics manual that we put out. Uh, there on this motor, I'm still measuring over 2 giga ohms, which doesn't surprise me because that's a motor that has never seen, and never seen voltage ever. It, is not, it came from the manufacturer as a sample, so they might have pot tested it, but no one else has. So that motor has not seen any work voltage. 20 million is ideally telling you it's a brand new motor without cable. If you notice, at 500,000 ohms for a submersible motor, that's typical of an older, older one in the well. If you're under 200,000, even though we don't have it there, 200,000 is where I start to wonder if I should replace the motor. And you look at the age of the motor, and if the motor is old and the, you're, you're measuring less than 200,000, I'd probably want to replace it. This is an analog mega ohm meter. Uh, some guys say there's no such thing. Uh, you know, and, and I say, yes, there is. Yes, there is. And you can see here, it sets up, it gives you the instructions on how to set it up on the back for your probe set. Now, this one, you'll notice it has coloration for the different lines you want to read. Ohms, with the horseshoe or the mega sign there, is always in green. So when I push the button, if you notice, this one too goes up to 50 million ohms. It's hooked up to that same motor that was measuring 2 giga ohms from the digital. So that's why the meter doesn't even fluctuate. Capacitance, we already talked about that. We want to get a solid number on this device here. That capacitor is rated for 86, but it's measuring 105. So it's, it's measuring high, but that's okay for a start capacitor. This test, like I said, the old Simpson, it only tells you that it's seen the voltage and the capacitor is trying to store it. Nowhere can I find out what my microfarads are. So this test, I'm not a big fan of it. That's my personal opinion. That mass tech, that green meter I showed you with the mega ohm meter test, that has a capacitor built into it. That one I bought for about $150 to $200. I would get a meter that has a true capacitance reader. Uh, another one I bought uh, when I was on the road, um, when I lost my original meter, I bought one for $79. It was a Klein. The Klein did not have the uh, meg ohm meter function, but it did read up to 200 microfarads for uh, capacitance. So just research, and you, depending on what you do, if you don't need a meg ohm meter, I would still buy one that at least can read capacitance. Here's our start capacitor. Remember, Best thing is first physically inspect it. Uh, make sure that it's not damaged. You might see the dielectric material le leaking out. Then we know it's damaged. If not, hook it up. Now, one thing I want to point out, if you see that top picture, you see the resistor there in place, it will cause it to read differently. So what I did, and, and understand the only thing that capacitor is there, or that resistor is there for on the capacitor, is to bleed the voltage down slowly so it makes it safe to handle. Anytime you hold a capacitor, period, anytime, even if it's never been in a circuit, I'm always in the habit of taking an insulated screwdriver and with a metal blade, 
put it across the two points. You see where the red probe or the red alligator clip and the, and the, and the black alligator clip are hooked up. Run across that without anything hooked up. Run across those two separate spades to discharge the capacitor, much as that resistor is trying to do. But in order to read capacitance, you got to clip that resistor out in order to read capacitance. So it went from reading 111, which was too high for an 86 microfarad uh, capacitor, down to 100, which put it right back into the proper spec. Now you can then solder the resistor back into place to make it safe again. I would recommend it, but if you don't know how to do that, just understand the only thing that resistor does is discharge that over time. Anytime you handle any capacitor, be it start or run, always discharge it properly with an insulated screwdriver. Run capacitors, remember they can be plus or minus, uh, here we say 6%, so that one is reading 34.9, that one should read 35 or better but it, it can be minus 6%, so that, that run capacitor is perfectly fine. Conductivity. Conductivity purely is used to tell you that voltage can pass through that bulk of wire. It does not tell me the resistance. If you, you know, Unfortunately, you can't hear the picture, but that, that unit there, when I hooked up the wires, it was toning. But it's, if you notice, it measured 0.0000. That particular meter, when you put it up to set for conduct for uh, conductivity, it just tones. It does not measure. So again, what meter do you need in, in conclusion? Well, what did you use in the past? What did you grow up with? What are you comfortable with? Okay. Are you working with three-phase? Then maybe you want analog. So what kind of job are you doing? Are you working with a variable frequency drive? You better get yourself a meg-ohm meter. Okay. And finally, what is your budget? Take the time to research know what you're buying okay are you comfortable with analog versus digital especially if you're using three phase I would lean towards analog okay now also read the factory manual because often you have to interpret the scale or know what the K the M and the OL is trying to tell you okay that's it thank you very much for listening and putting up with me I hope this is in, uh, good information um, now I always tell people these are works in progress so when you have ideas or something that is still bothering you, something in the field that maybe is new uh, or there's changes that you want more understanding, please contact us. We're more than happy to make webinars because uh, we do listen to our students. Meters 101, this is because students requested it. Uh, if you have some ideas, send them to training.institute at pentair.com. That's training.institute at P-E-N-T-A-I-R.com. Uh, this is Dan. I'm from the Pentair Training Institute. Thank you for your time. Have a great day.